Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of the U-Turn Podcast, here for you every single week to help upgrade your confidence and elevate your work and love life. I'm your host, Ashley Stahl. Perhaps you know me as a former counterterrorism professional at the Pentagon, a life coach, a Forbes columnist, or the founder of Cake Publishing Ghost Writing House. We've got four free e-courses for you on U-TurnPodcast.com. That's Y-O-U-T-U-R-N Podcast.com. So head on over there if you want to grab one of those to land a new job you love, find your purpose in the workforce, launch your dream business, or get more connected in your romantic relationships. And now let's get started with this week's guest. This episode is brought to you by Cake Publishing, ghostwriting, publicity, and copywriting house there to help influencers and entrepreneurs get their voice out there in a much bigger way. If you're ready to make a bigger impact, head on over to cakepublishing.com. That's C-A-K-E publishing.com. Hey, everybody. It's Ash, and I've got Onyx Segal here, and he is not only a serial entrepreneur, but he has a book that's coming out. And not only is it coming out, but it's free for you. All you got to do is catch the shipping. It's called Escape, the Four Stages of Becoming a Successful Entrepreneur. And he's here on the show to talk about the employee mindset versus the entrepreneur mindset. But before we get into that, I would love to talk more with you, Onyx, about your story. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It is awesome, and uh, I can't wait to have a chat. Let's talk about stuff. Yeah, and you know, before we started recording, I was just noticing we know a lot of the same people, so I'm like, I, it's so funny that we get to meet this way on the podcast versus in real life. Uh, but you're you're obviously doing a lot of important things, and you sound like a very heart centered entrepreneur. So. I would love if you could, it, it's so easy, I think, as entrepreneurs for us to be like, this is all of our success. And you're a huge success with six companies, a nonprofit, making millions in revenue. But I would love to learn from you when it wasn't this way or what your journey was to get to this point. Yeah. Ooh, where do I start, right? So I always uh, I always respond to that by saying, how much time do we have? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, times are good now. So even now, right, people say, oh, well, everything's good for you now. No, it's not. I mean, I used to work my butt off. It's hard. I have I have failures and hardships every single day. That's just a part of life. And we use it to grow to the next step. Right. But if we go back to when I was first starting. Um, so my entrepreneurial success, like we I've sold over two hundred million dollars worth of products. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm part of six companies right now. Um, and, and I love it. And I'm probably working on three more for next year. But the, the cool thing is I don't have to like run all of them right so now i get to help build teams and do all of that fun stuff so yes from that perspective i'm super blessed with all the knowledge i've gained over the last 15 years go back 15 years ago though when i was just starting i literally was a college kid now i'm indian by descent so i was basically set to be a doctor right that's not, that's uh-huh. never been to a hospital yeah. you will see it full of indian doctors and that's <laughs> exactly what i was going to be um but and, and, and the reason for it was very simple. As a kid, I made a couple of very simple connections. I looked around and I said, okay, all of the people in our community with the nicest cars, the nicest homes, and the most respect are doctors. So I'm going to be a doctor so that I can have nice things like them. Now, the problem is when I – and I worked hard. I worked really hard. I'm not a smart person. I just out-hustle everybody around me. Like mm-hmm. You can't out-hustle me. That's one thing I will always win in. So throughout high school, I got great grades because I would be up until 3 in the morning studying. And I got into the perfect program in college. I was literally on a one-way track to becoming a doctor and probably going to Harvard or any major university for med school because I had a full scholarship for undergrad and these schools were already recruiting me my freshman year in college. Wow. So all sounds great. My parents are super proud. I have a full scholarship. My dad doesn't have to spend money on my education. You know, everyone's raving about me. Everyone's talking about me. But here's a problem. I get to college and within the first few weeks, Ashley, within the first few weeks i had this moment where my eyes opened and i thought this isn't Uh-oh. for me <laughs> so I'm yes so happy. <laughs> i'm so so unhappy this is like the worst and do you know people would say like first world problems like oh yeah. really kid like College. full scholarship best university got everything you want even your books are paid for and you're not happy and i'm like yeah dare i say i'm not happy like i don't want to go to another bio class i'm going to kill myself you know yeah. Um, And the thing is, I have nothing but a most respect for doctors. I I have a lot of health issues. They've saved my life more than a few times. And I love them to death. It doesn't mean like I want to be one of them. That's all. So 
I um, really battled with this for quite some time, and I, and I couldn't help but continue thinking about little things that happened in my life, right? So when I was young, I was in third grade, I started my first business. I had a lemonade stand in the community, but the cool thing about my lemonade stand is I never worked it, not even one day of my life. I had younger kids. I had first graders working the lemonade stand. And... Oh, my gosh. Child labor <laughs> so early on, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so... There's always a, a level of uh, criminal activity when it comes know, to starting okay. your business. Yeah. Well, don't worry. My parents had to shut down within a few weeks due to neighborhood complaints. So okay, that fair was, enough. Uh, fair enough. That was over very quickly. <laughs> but um, I kept thinking about all these little things I've done. And so the connection I made from all of that is I thought, oh, I, I, you know what? I think I'm, in, I'm, I like business. Like I want to be in business. So you want to, I mean, it was so, so painful, but eventually two years in, Okay, so I, about a year and a half, not two, a year and a half in, I've now, I'm a sophomore. I'm still studying to be a doctor, I finally muster up the, the strength because one of my friends really just, she pushed me. And I go to my parents and I say, I don't like this. And I thought there would be a nuclear war in my home that day. Mm. Um, and my parents looked at me and they literally said, kid, we think you're doing the wrong thing, but you're our son. We want you to be happy. We'll support anything you do. That's and amazing so here I am. parenting. Wow. Oh, amazing parents. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today without without my parents. I love them to death. They, they are awesome. And so I literally switched universities. I lost my full scholarship. Everything went away. And I go to join business school. So I'm super excited. Starting my junior year, I'm way behind on classes, et cetera, et cetera. Within a week, actually, within a week of going to classes, I'm like, crap, I hate this too. <laughs> It happens. You know, I think a lot of people, their biggest fear is not, it's, it's like if they hate their job or they hate where they are, it's not knowing where to go next. So I'm also really curious to learn like how you intuitively navigated, like what to do next. But yeah, talk to me. Yeah. So you know what? Um, I kind of realized at that point that I think it wasn't school that I hated. It was the, it was the, uh, it was the thought process of learning and not applying. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to come home and do stuff. I wanted to come back to my dorm room and like do something that was active. So I started looking around for what to do. Now this is literally blank slate. You want to make some money. You know, you want to do something on the side. You want to be able to add an income to your life. And, and this is blank slate. I go to Google when it just started back then. So this is like how long ago it was. And I type in how to make money. <laughs> and Google literally did an auto suggestion and it said online. And I thought, sure, <laughs> why not? You oh, know, wow. how to make money online? That sounds cool. Um, and that was what led me to a journey of just who knows how the heck I ended up where I am today, but it was crazy. I, for 18 months though, I tried everything. I went through every hurdle. You, you know what? When I hear the messaging from people that says, hustle, hustle, just hustle, hustle all day. I don't really believe it because I was hustling a lot during those 18 months. I was hustling a lot and nothing was happening. I mean, I don't even know how I lasted 18 months, to be honest with you. And like most people would quit way before that. And I did. I finally got to a point where I was like, that's it. Every man has his, his limits. I've reached a mine. I'm done. Mm. And that was when I made a post on the forum and I said, listen, guys, thank you so much for all your support that you've given me the last year and a half. I'm done. I think I'm going to go off. If I don't make any money finally in the next 24 hours, like I quit. It's not for me. I'm going to go off. I was getting job offers from like Wall Street and all these great places. I'm just going to go do one of those. And you know what? This is when I, I don't know, you know, how your listeners or if you believe in the divine, but I sure as heck do. Something happened that day that, I, that changed my life forever. And I don't know who did it. Um, a person messaged me on the forum that that had zero history on the forum, had never posted on the forum, and said, kid, I've been watching you for over a year. I'm incredibly impressed with your hustle. I do not want you to quit. I don't want to see you fail. I will help you personally for the next 24 hours. You can direct message me on this forum as much as you want. Let, don't quit, though. And here I'm looking at this problem, like, who is this person? Like, they don't have one post, even no history on the wow. forum. Wow. I'd be like, God, is that you? <laughs> yeah, seriously, right? And yeah. So I was like, and I almost said no, but this is another thing. Like, this is amazing how the smallest decisions in your life can make the biggest impact. Had I said no that day, we wouldn't be talking today. Mm -hmm. You know? And so I said yes, though. Thankfully, I said, what do I have to lose? Even if this guy's playing a prank on me, let me just let me try it, right? And we were up that night until 3 in the morning. He's showing me what to 
do or, or he or she i don't know who it was it. <laughs> yeah. um, you know and this person is showing me what to do and I, I went to bed at three in the morning like i passed out and i woke up six hours later i rushed to the computer like i and i log in i remember i almost hit my head on the table i rushed so fast and there it was i made three hundred dollars wow i had made more money in six hours of sleeping than i had made you know 18 months of hustling that is the craziest and, experience uh, yeah, a was, random it, person it was, in a chat room. Wow. Yeah, and, and, and so there I started to learn a lot of my lessons early on about the power of mentorship, coaching, yes. having someone that knows it, done it, help you. And you know what? Ever since that day, I've never gone a day in my life without having a coach or a mentor. And sometimes mentorship can be like a book, like a book can mentor you, right? There's so many amazing people that have lived and gone by now, and we can't have them as mentors because they are no more. But there's no reason why we can't have them as mentors through an amazing book they wrote before they left. Um, and so it really, for me, it was a big pivotal change in my life. And so back then, it, this is how it was raw. Like anyone listening right now, I, this is how raw it was. And any one of our students who starts today, who's trying to make money online and trying to build a business, they start just as raw. And I sit here and I smile because I know it sounds and feels like such an impossible feat, but it's like riding a bicycle or it's like driving a car. You know, the first time you get in a car and they tell you, do this, do this, remember to do this order, remember to do this. Okay, here's all the rules. You're like, how the heck am I ever going to remember all this? I'm going to hit someone and kill someone. Mm. But yet fast forward a few months and driving becomes a subconscious thing. You're not even actively thinking about what you're doing. It just becomes, you know, human reaction. Yeah. That's what I feel like making money online or becoming an entrepreneur, building a business is like. The first time it's super daunting, it's super hard, it's raw, it's scary. But once you've done it once or twice, it just becomes second nature. And it and all of a sudden you look back and you're like, Man, why why was I doing what I was doing before? Like that's crazy. Like I should have been doing this the whole time. And so that's, that's really where I started. And, you know, all of it was, it's just, they're all blessings. Like I don't ever sit and trick myself thinking like, oh my God, I'm so awesome. I did all of this. No, <laughs> it was a series of amazing things that led me to do this. But you had said that you had lost millions of dollars and that you went through a hard time with that. So I'd love to learn what brought you to that place where you yep. were doing super well. I have the same experience. So I'm always curious to hear about fellow people who have gone from riches to nearly bankrupt because I get it. Uh, and then, you know, just like you, I was on to my next company. I'm so curious to hear what that journey was. Yeah, it's so funny, right? You, you said nearly bankrupt, and I'm like, nah, I was pretty much bankrupt. You're actually like, bankrupt, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, $1.7 million in debt would pretty much wow. be defined as bankrupt at that point. I wasn't officially, I didn't declare it, but um, yeah, so what happened, right? When I made my first $300 that night, if we just fast forward, I started doing really well after that. I started growing. I started, you know, learning and I grew the company from, you know, what that $300 night up to doing 10 million a year. Um, I was traveling the world on top of, I was on top of the world, really. I mean, I was mm -hmm. traveling first class. I was speaking. I was sometimes in three countries in a week. Um, and so we're talking just six years, like six years. I grew the company to 10 million a year and I had three offices, 96 employees, and I was just starting to really get greedy. Um, now, I'm not the kid who makes a lot of money and then goes and starts splurging on gold teeth and fancy cars. Um, I still lived with my parents because I was barely home. And when I did come home, I would go to my parents' house. I didn't even own a property. I was investing all my money back into the business. So everything so far still sounds great. It wasn't like I was doing anything bad. However, however, um, 2008 happens. Now, most of us, at least those who live in America, know what 2008 happened was yeah. the economy collapsed. Um, and, and really... I sat back. Now, I'm a first-time CEO, first-time entrepreneur, right? So I look around me in my industry, and I see that everyone's still doing well. Yes, the economy, I'm watching TV and the news, and I hear it, but I'm not seeing it. So I thought, Meh, not for me. Keep going. Scale up. Build up. Go. And add more expenses. Add more employees. Every time I had a problem in my life, get another employee. I built an office in India. I built two offices in India, actually. I built a huge office here in America. 2009, and I start to really feel the burn. I'm like, uh oh, things are happening. My revenue is starting to fall apart. My expenses are going up. Uh, it's okay. Have a problem. Hey, hire VPs, hire directors, hire management. They'll come in and take care of it. Delegate everything out. You, mm -hmm. you're a business owner. You know, work on your business, not in your business. And uh, so I did that. I hired VPs. I hired directors. And by um, that, 
I think like by end of 2010. And by the time before I was even 28, and this is when I was 27, you know, it was like, it felt like a blink of an eye. Um, so when I was 25, I won an award from Business Week. I was one of the top entrepreneurs under 25. I was literally came in number two um, out of the whole country. So that's me when I'm 25. By the time I am late 27, I am $1.7 million in debt. Uh, my parents had to take a second loan on their home. So you'll see my parents come up in the story again and again and just supporting me like crazy. It was one of the toughest things I've ever done in my life. Even today when I talk about it, sometimes I just get teary-eyed because I was so down and out that I had to, my, my father finally saw it in me. I never shared with him, but he saw it in me. And one day I remember he pulled me aside uh, after dinner and he said, son, talk to me, what's wrong? And I just burst out into tears and I told him all of what was going on and how I wasn't gonna make payroll and all of this. And he walked away, came back with a checkbook and he's like, the house is worth X amount. This is how much of a mortgage I can take, write whatever dollar amount you want. And I, I took that, I, my closest friend, who's basically like my little brother, lent me his entire life savings, $170,000. Um, I owed MasterCard, Visa, American Express. I owed all my friends who are affiliates and vendors. I owed my own bankruptcy lawyer who was advising me to do, to do bankruptcy, which I never did. Um, I refused to actually. Um, I owed everybody money and I got to the point where my phone was ringing off the hook. I actually, I always tell people, I tell people now, this took me a while to be able to talk about openly. Yeah. But, I think the first time I talked about it was a year ago. So have you ever watched a Hollywood movie actually where um, you see that guy who's down and out, he's got a whiskey bottle and a paper bag and a motel, beat up motel. That was you. <laughs> sitting in the corner, storming outside. Starring a- Onyx and Gall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's such a Hollywood scene. Well, yeah. crap, put my name right on that. You're right. Starring Onyx and Gall. That was me. I actually ran away for a week. Nobody knew where I was. Family employees, managers. I ran away to a hotel in Goa, India in a crappy oh nooks gosh. of the city. And I drank myself nearly to death, by the way. I ended up in the hospital a week after that, major internal bleeding. Um, that was my wake up call. Wow. I was just really down and out. My relationships were falling apart. Everything was going down. Um, and, and, and it really forced me to come back. And, and I had another, I had another God moment. I had another angel in my life that came in who I'll never be able to thank because I don't know who they are. I was on a plane, I was flying back to the United States, I'd gotten very sick, so I turned around halfway. So I went to Amsterdam on my way to India, got really sick in Amsterdam, and decided, you know what, I'm going back to the US. So I started having a lot of internal bleeding, I could tell, I was getting really sick. And I just wanted to get back to my doctors, so I, I really just fought my way to get onto that plane. I was white as a ghost, I was sweating, the flight attendant said, sir, are you okay? I said, yeah, yeah I'm just tired. I sat down in the plane, and that's it, I blacked out. The next thing I know, I'm strapped to a stretcher being pulled off the plane and the plane's been pulled over on the tarmac from right before the runway. And I found out later that the person who was sitting next to me saw something and waved the flight attendant down. And I can only imagine I was sleeping. I mean, they could have easily just thought I'm sleeping, right? But somebody saw something, they waved the flight attendant. So before the plane took off, they pulled me off. Now, I found out later that I had bled out almost half of my body's blood. Oh my God. And that had that plane taken off, it would have been over the Atlantic Ocean. I would have had maybe 60 to 90 minutes before I would have gone into shock and died. Wow. So I was literally about 60 to 90 minutes away from death. Um, And again, Whoever that person is, I asked the airlines, I said, please give me the person's name. I need to reach out to them. They said, no. I said, can you send them a note for me on my behalf? They said, no. So I'll never be able to really thank them. But, um, oh. you know, when I came back home from that, my, my parents, my, my brother-in-law, my father rushed to Amsterdam to get me from the hospital. I came home and I said, Anik, this, this is not, man, this isn't going to work this way anymore. Like, what's wrong? What's going on? And what did you do? And that was when I, that was when the entrepreneur was born. That was when I started having the biggest epiphanies and realizations. And I realized that you got to stop chasing money and you got to start creating value. You got to know who you are, what your mission is, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and you know what? I, I went from 96 team members down to six. I closed all my offices and I literally paid back every penny of my debt in 16 months from that moment. Wow, that's incredible. It was pretty pretty, pretty intense, but um, I learned the greatest lessons. I will go the rest of my life saying I am so grateful and so thankful that I came to that moment in my life and I fell into that much debt and I nearly died because 
without it, I would have never had the reboot that I needed to become the person I am today. I love what you're saying, and I relate to it on such a visceral level. I mean, I I grew up with a dad who he had 300 employees. He dropped out of college. He started a company down in L.A. He lost it all. He claimed near bankruptcy, and he didn't claim the bank. He just got out away from it. And then I myself, my first company, we did about five million in four months. And I did the same thing as you. I didn't know what to do with it. I needed to hire out. I needed to delegate. Next thing I knew, I was negative four hundred thousand dollars. So many people were, you know not 1.7 million in your case, so many people were like, oh, just claim bankruptcy as if it was like an out and yeah, something inside of right. me. I had the same, it's so crazy to be talking to you because I didn't even know, I, I, I kind of have had been looking at myself in the mirror after I was $200,000, you know, paying the debt down. And then I still had 200,000 more and it felt like this mountain that I was climbing. And I thought, man, why didn't I just claim bankruptcy? But there's just a part of me that was like, I want to handle this myself because if I don't, I'm just like anybody else that isn't having, like, I don't know, there's something about taking the responsibility for it. Um, what, what drove you to not claim bankruptcy and opt out of it? You know, so here, how was I like, so if I declare bank, here's what drove me to it. First of all, I'm a man of my word. If I owe you money, I owe you money. I don't care if you're American Express with billions of dollars. We have an agreement. Yes. I got to pay you back. That's how I feel. Um, and if, if I, if I'm not a man of my word, if I, if I don't have my word, I have nothing. You know, I have no honor, I have no integrity, I, and I'm, I'm worth nothing. I don't care if I'm worth a billion dollars. If I'm not a man of my word, I'm nothing. So that was something that I learned from my father. I was taught from very young age, contracts are not necessary. A handshake is all it should ever take. Um, but more than even that, who was I going to say that I'm bankrupt? My father, who literally spent his entire life as an employee working for the government, paying off his home. Was I going to turn around and tell him, Dad, I'm so sorry that $350,000 that you loaned me, I can't pay you back. You're on your own. Was I going to turn around to the young, my, my younger brother, who's not really my blood brother, but he may as well be? Was I going to turn around to him and say, I know you gave me your life savings of $170,000, but hey, I'm, I'm bankrupt now, so too bad, so sad. Um, you know, I, these people I loved, these people believed in me, these people supported me during the time that, you know, I needed them the most. I wasn't going to turn my back on them. No way, a chance in H-E double hockey sticks that I was going to Oh, you can that. say so, whatever you want. We, we swear on this podcast. You do whatever you want. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Well, yeah, no, no chance in the I'm going to do that, okay? So, yeah. Um, so I said, you know, no way. I'm, 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 I'm fighting my way through this one way or the other. But I did, I did make myself one promise. So during that entire time, there was one thing I did decide to do for myself. Um, and that was this. I said, I'm going to sit down and we're going to figure out what is my why? What is my purpose? Why am I doing all of this? Now, if I don't have an answer, if I don't have a clear answer that tells me this is your big change the world impact vision thing that you want to do, then it's okay. I'm sure I'll have one one day, but I would rather spend my time working on helping somebody else build towards their vision rather than just chase money. So I'm mm -hmm. going to come back. I'm going to pay everybody back, but I'm not going to sack. I'm not going to chase money. I'm not going to sacrifice on who I am anymore because I've been sacrificing yes. who I am for years and that led me to where I am today. And what, what was so amazing is I had the answer very quickly. I knew exactly what it was. And everything that came after that was not there to make money to pay my debt back. Everything I did after that was to live in the true, like in the, my true purpose. And the two things just converged because I loved what I was doing so much and I was able to pay everybody back in 16 months, mm -hmm. you know? So, so it, it all fell in place. And today, every decision I make is in line with my purpose. And I don't think it's coincidence that I'm scaling and growing so fast. Yes. I don't think it's coincidence at all. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting because people talk about chasing money, but money, I think is just something that follows. And you know, I love that you talk about your rock bottom because I think that there's a dignity to hitting your rock bottom and I think it's so important and we live in a world where there's a lot of codependence where other people care about somebody and they want to spare them their rock bottom and I find that when you really allow somebody the dignity of hitting their rock bottom, they are able to have the awakenings, the awarenesses, the clarity that's available for them down there at the bottom. Uh, and I, so I really get that. But I'm also curious, you know, my dad, when he lost all of his money, I, I'll never forget, I was seven, and he looked at me and he said, you know, Ashley, and he's a very funny man, my dad, so it's always, con but he has a lot of emotional depth, but he looked at me seriously and he said, you know, Ashley, the people, the people who lose the kind of money I just did, they kill themselves. 
And I remember being seven years old and looking at him thinking, oh my God. And in that moment, I made money and the process of earning it mean that it could kill you. And so I'm curious, and I, you know, I've done a lot of healing with money to continue to make it to bounce back like you did, pay off my debt, start another company. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that you're on this podcast because this is my highest passion project yet is this podcast and getting it out there. Like, I just really enjoy conversations like this one. And I'm so curious to hear from you. How do, what do you think happened in your mindset about money that created the results that you've been able to create, even with the, what, what you could argue is trauma, like a traumatic experience of losing it all, humbling yourself, asking for your parents' support, hitting rock bottom. What did you do on your mindset to keep pushing and earning and being a success? <laughs> That's an awesome question, by the way. So, um, and probably the first time I've ever been asked that question, believe it or not. Um, I have a very, 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 very specific way of looking at money, and I think that most people in the world look at it very differently. Money for me is a tool. It's an investment tool. It is a tool that's meant to function on its own. So it's, it's I guess, a better word than saying tool is it's a machine. Mm-hmm. When I look at money, I look at it as something that will churn out what it is that I program it to churn out. So if I built a machine, I as the creator of that machine can tell it what to do, what to create, what to make. And so the way we train our money and and what kind of machine it becomes is by what we do with it. So a lot of people with the employee mindset look at money as a source of enjoyment. There's a very big difference between that. So many people with, with the employee mindset, they look at money as a source of enjoyment, and there's a reason behind that. We'll get into that. What worse is an entrepreneurial mindset towards money is they look at it as, a, as cool. a, an investment, mm. as a tool for investment. So the reason a lot of people with the employee mindset look at it as a tool for enjoyment is because we work really hard to get it, right? We trade hours of our lives in order to achieve that. So when we have a job, we, we might make 50 bucks an hour or whatever, even, you know, for the high paid, um, it's still 50 bucks an hour, mm-hmm. right? So it's like for every hour you work, you get 50 bucks. So now when your job ends at five o'clock, you are no longer getting money. So what happens is you end up declaring me time, their time. So at five o'clock, anything that happens after five o'clock is, is your time. You're going to go enjoy yourself because you're not trading that time for money. You're going to go enjoy yourself. Well, how do you enjoy yourself? We well, you use the money that you spent the last eight hours of your life making. So it's time to relax. It's time to go to happy hours. It's time to watch Netflix. It's time to go buy a new television. It's time to buy that car you've been dreaming of versus an employee an entrepreneur doesn't have that perspective an entrepreneur says man i just worked really hard to make this money tell you what what i should do with this money is put it in uh, put it in use in such a way that it'll make me more money mm-hmm. that way i can stop working for money and let my money work for more money mm-hmm. and that is exactly what i have done so when people ask me you know recently i bought an advertising deal and everyone was like what the heck why would you do this and i walked my team through my thinking process and they literally sat there and thought oh my god why didn't i think of that so i bought this ad deal for twenty thousand dollars and that sounded like a whole heck of a lot and what they didn't realize though is that i already had my plan b c and d with that investment. I knew that the worst case that happens is I make about 15 to 16 back. I might go negative three or 4,000. However, there was lots of ancillary benefits to that advertising deal that I could cap- uh, capture later. Well, anyways, long story short, we did the advertising deal. I ended up losing money. I lost 6,000. I was way above. I, I, I overestimated the success of the deal. And so everyone's like, oh man, we're never doing that again, yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera. But my ancillary benefits kicked in and I ended up closing another deal because somebody saw something. Anyways, that 20,000 has now become $75,000. Yes. I, you always have to trust that instinct. And you know what you're actually touching on is Um, I think a deeper question for everybody listening is instincts. I mean, you're an intuitive guy, obviously, Onik. And and by the way, I wonder if we've had the same people mentor us because Jay Abraham has mentored me a bit. I know he mentors Damon John, so he's probably talked with you quite a bit. But I'm curious, what what has given you this access to your intuition and your ability to connect to yourself? Because we live in a disconnect. We're more disconnected than ever. The data indicates it. You know, it's not just my opinion. I'm curious. How are you hearing the answers inside of yourself in such a loud, noisy world? 
Uh, you know what? It's um, it's funny because when I ask a question or when something comes to me, I think back to advice that Tony Robbins once gave. He didn't really give it to me directly, but he may as well because he was standing right in front of me and he's a bit of, bit of an authoritative figure when he's in front of you, so you pay yeah. attention. He's a big um, man. I was in a small room. What's that? He's a strong and tall man. Like I, yeah, I sat exactly. front row there. Yeah. I, I was in a I was in a small room of like 20 people. He walks in and he's kind of shaking our hands. He was right in front of me, but someone on the other side of the room screamed out, "Tony, what's the number one advice you'd give us about success?" And he chuckled because I can only imagine now where I am today, 15 years later, how many times he gets asked that question. God, yeah. it's such a it's it gets annoying after a while. But anyways, he gave a great answer. So he kind of looks right towards me as he's giving the answer to the group, and he says, "You know what? Success is directly connected to your ability to make fast decisions." Mm. And and I, and I remember at the time, I'm like, what the heck is he talking about? Like, we can't make fast decisions. We have to make, we have to analyze the decisions. We have to think through the decisions. We have to make smart decisions. Today, I've come to realize after 15 years of doing this, building multiple companies, selling over $200 million online, is this. Look, if you're going to make the wrong decision, you can either take two weeks to make it or you can take two minutes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the real truth to success is that you su- success is success is literally a combination of failures. Yeah, people don't realize that. So success is created by combining failure. And so actually, if I want to get to success faster, I need so to fail faster. Su- yes. Gosh. And so rather, so that's what helps me make decisions quickly now is when something comes in front of me, I quickly ask myself the following question. Okay, what impact is this really going to have on me if it goes south? So a $20,000 ad deal, to me, if it goes south and I lost all of it, I'm not sure I would even spend more than five minutes thinking about it. It wouldn't change my life in my current state in my business. So why should I spend more than a few minutes thinking about whether I should do it or not? If I wouldn't even spend more than a few minutes thinking about if I lost it all. Mm-hmm. So, and, but, but would I learn something from it? I said, you know what? Absolutely I would because I would learn that this entire type of advertising doesn't work for me. That would be in a superb, that would be a superb lesson. I don't have to go to sleep every night thinking about, wait, well, would this work? Would this work? Would this work? And so I, I, that's how I, that's why I can hear the voice because I am able to follow my first gut instinct yes. to something simply because I'm not scared if it's wrong. And it is wrong. A lot of times it's wrong, but I don't care. Yes, it's okay. When it as hits, long as I learn right. from it, I don't care if it's Yeah, wrong. and you fail your way there. And then once it hits yeah. and you're so right. You know, I found so many people who are afraid to make decisions and I know that that links to confidence and I, I'm, a couple questions about that with your mind, and I know we'll also get into the employee versus entrepreneur mindset even further, but I'm curious, A, around burnout, because you talked about how you can out-hustle anybody, and I know you're connected to purpose, and I t- truly believe that when you feel connected to something like I do with this podcast or with my book deal, it's like it pulls you forward. You don't need to work that hard. You want to be doing it like you, you're inspired by it, but a lot of the times that hustle and that push, it burns you out, and so I'm curious you know, looking back and you having been pulled out of a stretch on an airplane, had one too many at a hotel in Goa. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> curious to learn, you know, where did you learn to manage your, your energy and your burnout? Because this is a very distracted world where, you know, and I'm a to- I'm a two year old toddler sometimes with shiny object syndrome myself. So how do you manage your energy so that you don't get burnt out? And how do you overcome burnout? That's awesome. All right. So you may not like my answer, though, because it's going to be kind of funny. Um, <laughs> Ashley, have you seen a show called Lost? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Okay. That's so retro. It's I been so long. how to handle my emotions from a show called Lost. And I have <laughs> That's no, deep. I have a zero um, shame in telling this story because it really made that much of an impact. There's one scene in season one. They've crashed. There's, for those of you who don't know Lost and you're listening, it's a, it was one of those big shows where everyone crashes on an island. They're lost and crazy, freaky things are happening on the island. And so in, it was like, I don't know, halfway through the season, there's a scene where there's like black smogs of smoke and crap running around and people are scared. But there's one guy, the doctor, one of the main characters. He's, he's just he's very calm. And so another one of the main characters, this girl, asks the doctor, how do you stay so calm, right? We're like literally about to die and you're just sitting here calm. And he tells this story that I remember listening to and thinking, man, that's interesting. He tells a story about how when he was a resident becoming a surgeon, he's a neurosurgeon, so he does spinal surgery. He says, I was fine. I was in years of surgery. I always have a, a, a senior surgeon with me. The first surgery I had to do on my own when I was officially a doctor, he goes, I ended up doing something wrong. And this woman's entire spinal cord system just flared onto the, de- uh, onto the, um, 
onto the entire um, surgical table. He goes, as far as I knew, I had just paralyzed her for life. And he goes, I was absolutely just panicking. He goes, so what I decided to do at that moment is I told myself, you know what? Instead of trying to bury this fear, instead of trying to hide from the emotion of the moment that I'm feeling, why don't I just let myself feel it? So I sell, I said to myself, you have 10 seconds. Let the fear overtake you. Go ahead, have a panic attack and feel what you're feeling. But on second 11, it's over. We get our shit together and we get this thing done. And so he did and he fixed her and then eventually she was fine and he actually married her later. So this is obviously a, <laughs> a, a, it's, it's a fake show, guys. So it's not a true story, but it may as well be for the impact that it had on my life. But ever since that moment, I've realized something. We run around all day trying to hide our emotions. You know yes. what? When we're burned out, we don't want to be burned out. Mm-hmm. We, we, we feel like it's a weakness to say I'm burned out. You know, when we're upset or we're sad or we're depressed, we think it's a weakness to say we feel that way versus me. My, my entire approach to this is to say, this is how I'm feeling right now. So I'm going to feel it. It's okay. Right? So when I burn out, it's okay. I'm human. I'm going to burn out. So let me, now that I can acknowledge and accept, right? What do they say? The first step in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, right, is to accept mm-hmm. that you are. Mm-hmm. And so when I'm burned out, I say, hey, I'm burned out. I'm tired. You know what? Okay, I'm burned out. I'm tired. So I accepted that. Oh, my God, it's such a relief. And now I say, well, Anik, what do we get to do for for ourselves so that we're not burned out anymore? And almost always, if you just listen, your your mind tells you, your heart tells you, you know what? I want this. And just give it to it. Plan it. A lot of times I've come to learn, like right now, we're in the middle of this big book launch. It's doing super well, super successful, but I'm working 19 hour days. I'm tired, but I plan something next week with my wife. We're getting away for two days. And the minute I planned it, the minute we had the plan set, I wasn't burned out anymore. I'm still working just as hard, but now I turned burnout into expectation and excitement because I knew my time. I said, Anik, it's okay. Just get through this week, man. You got, you got your reward coming at the end of next week. And so I'm now, now I turned that burnout into being excited about what's coming. So, so really it, it, my, my thing to do is first of all, when you're burned out, the best thing you can do is take a break, take a time, just, just pull away. Trust me, the world will not end because mm-hmm. you're not there for you know, a day, um, pull out. But the, but before you can do that, you have to be okay with it. And you know what? If one day you're sad and you want to cry, go find a corner, be sad and cry. Like it's okay. Too many of us are trying too hard to hide our emotions, to cover them up and shove them underneath the carpet when you just need to experience it for a little bit, but give yourself a time. Say, look, I'm going to be crying and mopey and feel bad for myself, but I'm going to do that for the next six hours or eight hours. I'll eat a tub of ice cream and enjoy my life. Um, but at that, but then it's over. The pity party ends in eight hours and we get up and we fix it and you'll be amazed when you do that you make a deal with yourself you will stick to it it's pretty incredible Mm, you know i also think that a lot of the times the question we ask ourselves when we're feeling something uncomfortable is like how do we get rid of this whether somebody is going through a breakup or you know they lose all their money like you and i both have been part of that special club together um And I find that what I'm learning to ask life is not how can I get rid of this, but how can I be with this? And I'm really hearing the same thing from you. And so anybody listening, if you're going through something, I would say the first thing is just to ask yourself, are you avoiding something right now? What are you avoiding? And instead of asking yourself how to keep avoiding it, maybe asking yourself, how can I be with this? And I think it's really beautiful that you let yourself feel the burnout and then you move forward. Um, incredible. And sometimes it's so big that letting yourself feel it looks like taking a couple weeks off if you have to. Uh, whatever you can afford and to create is, is up to you. I'm curious also, on it just to learn, you sound like you've attracted a lot of magic in your career, like that chat room, that person in the airplane that really went out of their way to comment on you and make sure that you got some help for your health. Uh, I find that I'm always attracting magic all the time too. And sometimes I'll wake up and be like, today is a day that I want to create something magical and I will, I will do it. Like whether it's just through having more conversations with people, having open energy. So I'm curious for anybody listening, if they want to start creating that kind of magic in their life that you seem to have naturally flow towards you, you know, without not saying that there's still also trials and tribulations, do you have any feedback for anybody listening about how they could create more magic in the way that you have? 
Yeah, so it, so it's so funny. I um, am able to manifest into my life the craziest things. If I started going through the list of things I've already done by the time I'm 35 and the things and the experiences I've had, you would be absolutely amazed. Um, so I have done things like for anyone who's listening who has ever watched a, a Bollywood or Indian film, you'll, you'll be able to understand and appreciate the importance of this. Um, there's an actor in India. His name is Shah Rukh Khan. He was voted by People Magazine as one of the most one of the 25 most powerful people in the world above Oprah, by the way. He wow. is incredibly influential on, you know, every week on a certain day and certain time, 3,000 plus people pile outside his house in the hopes that he will come on the balcony and wave his hand. That is how big he is. Well, I've been friends with him. I've had, lo I've, I've sat with him. He served me food. We've been, we've texted one another, watched YouTube videos together, done business together. That was something I said back in college that I would do one day and my friends all said, you've freaking lost your mind. You haven't even been to India in 20 years. How are you going to connect with this guy? Well, just a couple of years after that, I, I wasn't, wasn't just connected to him. I was friends with him. Um, I've been able to attract wealth into my life. I literally have attracted the girl of my dreams into my life. My wife is about damn near perfect. I mean, she's mm. amazing. I have, I don't know, like it's literally anything I've ever wanted from materialistic to, you know, to uh, nonprofit, all the work that we do in nonprofit. I dreamt it years back I, before it started and I and it happened. So people ask me, you know, is that just some kind of like divine, you know, blessing? No, it's not. No, I mean, it's every one of us has this. Mm -hmm. Every one of us just has this. Here's the thing. When I say something, when I say I'm going to do something, I don't have a string of doubt. See, I learned, I've learned to expect miracles. And I think that that is a, that is something that takes practice. You have to have so much confidence in yourself and your ability and the universe and, and, and God and everything around you to give you what it is. You deserve what it is you want. So a lot of us are carrying around so much guilt and shame that we don't actually, de we don't feel we deserve what we're, we're dreaming of. So you're not expecting it, so it's not gonna happen. And even if it's happening, you may not recognize it. So for me, when I want something to happen, I declare it. It's actually one of the things I talk the most about in my book. I talk about the importance, like most billionaires and millionaires in this world today, they openly declare their goals. The most successful people openly declare they're going to do something. Let me tell you this. I did a test um, multiple times in front of live audiences, and it's amazing to see this. I ask everybody to raise their hands who has a best friend. I say, raise your hands if you have a, a best friend, someone who's super close to, to you. Usually like 95% of the audience will raise their hands. And I say, now keep your hands up only in the following situation. If I were to ask your best friend to give me a detailed, detailed answer on your biggest goal in your life, keep your hand up if your best friend could tell me your deepest goal in life. And you, it, it, is, it is literally heartbreaking to see the hands go down. Of that 95% that had their, rooms, their hands raised, I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating, 5% of the, the hands are left up. That's it. What do you think that's about? Why do you think it is that people yeah, aren't afraid? We, we just we're too scared to tell anyone what it is that we really, really want because what if it doesn't happen? Yeah. It's embarrassing, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I deal with this all the time. Like my friends, and, and and you know what? We're so afraid of telling other people about our dreams. Most of us don't even have a dream. Most of us don't even know what we want because forget other people. We're so scared of having to acknowledge to ourselves that it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, so people look at me and they say, Anik, you're so successful. What they don't realize is I'm only about a third as successful as I had dreamt of being by the time I'm 35. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I pick up Entrepreneur Magazine. I see stories of self-made billionaire by the age of 32. And I'm like, crap, I missed that that announcement. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm, I didn't make it. But I don't look at that and get depressed. It just inspires me more. I'm like, cool, I get to be a billionaire by the time I'm 45. How about that? Let's do that. Right. And so. It's how you perceive when you, it's, it's again, it's that relationship with failure, right? So a lot of people look at failure as a horrible thing. I look at it as an amazing thing that allows me to learn. So, hey, Anik, you failed at becoming a, a billionaire by the age of 35. So what did you do and what can we do differently in the next 10 years? And that gives me an opportunity to sit, evolve, to ask questions, to analyze, and then, you know, apply those teachings to the rest of my life, which... Of course, success then accelerates because you're learning and you're applying that knowledge. So it, it's, it's funny, but the, that's a very long answer to a short question. But it comes down to I openly declare what I want and I learn to expect it. I, and I know that it'll happen. And by doing that, my mind stays open to 
all of the different frequencies around me that make it happen. There's actually an anatomical part of our brain, by the way, that helps us manifest things. Most people don't even know it. It's called the reticular activating system. Look it up on Google. It's a little tiny little chunk of your brain that actually scientifically gets the closest to describing law of attraction or manifestation. It's physically present in your brain and it helps you attract the things that you think the most about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's that part of your brain that when you declare something, it shops for opportunities that it wouldn't otherwise be paying attention for. I think that's the, the RAS, I think, for those of you listening, it's the part of the brain where if somebody says to you, hey, have you, haven't you seen all these Teslas on the road? And then you, you say no, and then you, you're driving home and you see like 10 Teslas. It's because you've activated the RAS. So that's, that's amazing, Onik. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I'm also so curious to hear, you know, you said the employee mindset versus entrepreneurs. So you talked about how money, employees see that for enjoyment, entrepreneurs see that as a tool um, to invest. And you talked about time a little bit, um, but I would love to hear a little bit more about time and what is the difference between somebody who's in the mindset of an employee versus an entrepreneur? Yeah, so when it comes to time, um, I said it earlier, I kind of alluded to it. Man, um, their perspective is, again, so different, right? Me time, their time. That's how an employee thinks. Me time, their time. So their time being their employer, this is the time I use to trade for money. And me time, me time is for me. I get to have fun. I'm going to go have fun. I'm going to go enjoy myself. This is, I deserve this. I earned it because I spent all oh, so much time with them. So now I get me time. And that literally, again, comes back to splitting us up and we don't treat time as an investment. Let me tell you something, time is the only one thing in the world that is a limited commodity. We, there is no abundance of time. It doesn't exist, not yet. Um, we will die one day, and so time is utmost limited. So both employees and entrepreneurs look at time exactly the opposite. An employee looks at time and says, oh my God, it's limited, crap, let's have as much fun as we can. And an entrepreneur says, oh crap, time is limited. Man, what can I do to have the biggest impact that I can? Mm -hmm. Right. And so when I was in college, um, I, you know what? I went through four years of college. I was at University of Maryland College Park. We had at that time literally one of the best football teams in the country, and we had one of the best basketball teams in the country. We have an amazing campus. I had tons of friends. Not one basketball game or football game that I ever stepped foot inside of. Not one. All right? Frat parties. I went, I went to a few. Didn't really see the appeal of a bunch of people puking everywhere. Thought that time would have been better invested in my dreams that I'm trying to build towards. So I didn't really go to many that, that many parties. Now, does that mean I didn't enjoy college? No, I had a blast. I had awesome friends. I had a lot of fun. And but, it definitely doesn't mean you didn't enjoy a drink because we all know what happened that one night in Goa. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, I enjoyed plenty of drinks. Don't, 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 don't even worry Just about that. Just messing with you. Um, but, but see, that's what I'm trying to tell people is like, so now my friends, this, this is something I hate. I hate it when people tell me this, some, especially some of my friends who I knew back then because I know what they were doing with their time. I have people come to me and tell me, Anik, you're so lucky. If you ever want to get on my shit list, that's the first thing yes. you say. I think you're so lucky because as soon as someone tells me I'm so lucky, I have like one of those mo moments in my mind where I play, by, play my life back. And I'm like, dude, I am not lucky. I earned every penny of what I got right now. Like, I am not ashamed to say I deserve this. This is mine. Mm -hmm. I went out and got it. Like, I'm not lucky. Mm -hmm. You know, you were, you, you, you were doing all those other things. So, yes, I sacrificed a few years in college of a little bit of fun. But instead of now going to college basketball games, I get to sit in the club seats of my favorite professional team. You know, mm -hmm. instead of going to a college football game, I now get to go and be the VIP guest during one of their practices at my, uh, at, at my local professional team. So why? Because I took that time and I invested to building the life I have now. Yeah. And so time, again, is, a, is an investment. So for an entrepreneur, the day doesn't end at 5 p.m. Like, I don't, I, don't know, I don't have, people ask me, what do you do for fun? I genuinely sometimes don't have an answer. I'm like, uh, I, I love what I do. Like, I do what I do for fun. You know, mm. like I do my career for fun because it's that much fun. Well, um, but, you know, I want to challenge you on it because you said time and impact versus just, you know, time is something you have. You might as well have fun. Fun. But I mean, not everyone's core value is impact. Like, I think it's incredible that that's yours. For me, my core value is connection. And sometimes it happens to have an impact. So for example, I wanted to be connected to myself. And so I started writing. Um, and then my writing moved a lot of people. So it happened to make an impact. But I led with connection. And that's how I wanted to spend my time. And so I'm curious if just to challenge you, like, maybe there's some people out there that are entrepreneurs who 
they feel like, or, or, you know, employees that are like, I don't really feel the need to make an impact on a lot of people's lives while I'm here on this planet. And I don't know if there's any reason, you know, I think in society we have a judgment on that. Like people should want to make an impact. But I think it's okay if somebody comes into this body in this lifetime and they just want to experience life in the way that they do. So I'm curious what guidance you have for for somebody who that might not be their core value as far as impact. Can they still be an excellent entrepreneur? Because I know a lot of entrepreneurs that they see a problem in the market, they want to solve it. And um, whether it makes an impact or not, they're excited to go create and build. Maybe they're motivated by creation, you know? Absolutely. Actually, um, you're, good catch. I didn't mean impact as in changing the world, worldly impact. I meant impact as in, in whatever it is you're currently doing, an impact in you and impact yes. in the world around okay. you. So it's an impact in your life mm -hmm. is what I really meant. So, Amazing. you know, if, if, you said connection, right? So if going out and meeting people or going to networking events or going to meetups or going to community events or going to, if that drives impact for you, like if that makes you happy if that then then do that that's absolutely amazing i just meant really taking a minute to say you know what i have i have three hours today that are free what am i going to do with it and is that have meaning to me or am i going to sit and watch netflix now people say oh Anik, you mean you don't watch netflix are you kidding me i've binge watched every top tv show <laughs> you can possibly imagine i watch netflix but i watch it in its in its allotted time see i have time in my day in my week that is allotted for me to refresh my mind to spend time with my wife we love some tv shows we watch them together and so i've seen all the top shows it's just uh, it's in their window, in their time, mm -hmm. right? The rest of the time, I know what I'm doing because it has a deeper impact on me. But then when I, I'm tired, I'm burned out on Sunday, yeah, I'll sit for six hours and watch TV. I have no problem yes. because at that time, that's what I need at the time. It's just more of people taking a moment to say, okay, I have limited time, so am I using my time the best to what I want to be using it for right now. Yes, the short term and versus the long term. Most people don't even ask that question. That's the thing. They just kind of go along with the ocean and they just go wherever <laughs> time takes them. And I'm just saying challenge that notion. Time is limited. Every hour you let go, you're closer to death. So just know that and think about that. So that's how I think about time personally. I look at it as a gift that I get to use how I want to use. So let me just use it most efficiently, whatever that means for anyone that's different for everybody. Holy shit. It's like Ram Dass. We're all just walking each other home. What a reminder. And, you know, I also think everybody listening, you know, Anik, you're here talking a lot about your discipline, but how it's created so much freedom. I think people often see discipline and they think that's really limiting. I have to do this and I have to do that. But if you have a goal and you have the discipline to calendar it out and actually put it in real time and anchor it into your life, there's so much freedom that can follow. You know, I like to think about it like food. Like I love, I have this thing on my Instagram on it called Snacksidents where I just eat whatever I want. Yeah. But I was telling people, you know what, there's just, there's freedom in my discipline because, and I've started to eat better and eat more healthy because it, it was really affecting my ability to focus, my brain fog. And I was saying to somebody, you know, I guess if I, you know, didn't have the discipline, then I would have what a lot of people would think is freedom is having as many slices of pizza as I want. But what's going to happen if I have as many slices of pizza as I want? I'm going to get sick. You know, so I find that there's such a freedom in discipline for anybody listening who's avoiding their goals. Like, get the discipline to anchor those onto your calendar as real, non-negotiable blocks of time you spend with yourself. Amazing advice. Um, Onyx, so talk to me. You talked about time. You talked about money. How do employees versus entrepreneurs see problems? So problems, right? Um, I think I think employees and entrepreneurs definitely see problems very differently. So a problem is really something that a more of an employee mindset wants to avoid. Um, why deal with problems when you don't have to? Um, you know, like I said, a lot of the employee mindset does kind of go back to that me time and their time, and 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 that takes you back to well, a problem is something that's just going to be tough to deal with. I don't really want to deal with it, so I'm just going to avoid it, ignore it, put it off to somebody else. Versus an entrepreneur sees opportunity in problems. So an entrepreneur looks at an opportunity, uh, looks at a problem and thinks, you know what? Um, maybe if I just go ahead and take this head on, I could grow from it. Mm 
Uh -huh. um, you know, maybe if I just take this head on, I can learn something. Even if I even if I fall apart, even if I don't succeed, like something something here, maybe I can try to really do this. So, problems are a really a hassle for the employee mind, and I think that they're an opportunity for the entrepreneurial mind. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the biggest thing is. And and again, you know, like we said, um, success is a result of failures. It's a stacking of failures. Um, if you don't have any problems, you're never going to grow. The only way you grow is because you have problems, you find solutions, and then you grow. And then you have more problems, you can find more solutions, and then you grow. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, that, I think that that is a, a big differentiating factor. Got it. I got 99 problems and growth ain't one. Okay. Yeah. And then you said number four was dreams. So what's the difference um, with how an employee sees their dreams versus the entrepreneur? So, okay, so dreams... And I, 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 this is actually pretty crazy because this was the hardest one for me to digest because when I was doing all of the research for the book that I wrote, I, I spoke to about a thousand plus people probably at this point. And I heard this a lot from people and, and it was something that I hated hearing. I had, a, I had a cringing impact, but I've since learned to kind of be very sensitive to it, like a very understanding of it. But a lot of the people would react to the word of dream and say, and kind of go like, Ugh okay like dreams they would say you know what i'll dream when i have the time i'll dream when i have the money i'll dream when it's actually possible like i like a, you know, like a lot of this people would say like oh i'm not a i'm not a dreamer man i'm just a normal folk like i'm just you know and so it almost felt like people thought a lot of people think like they don't have the right to dream or they don't you know they shouldn't have a dream or they should wait till xyz and then they can dream and and that that just made me so confused because I'm because ever since I've been a kid I've always had a dream I've always had my next dream so for me it's like coded in my DNA and I'm like how do you even get up in the morning without a dream like how do you wake up if you don't have a dream like it is yeah, any dream like your dream could be to own the, a Rolls Royce fine whatever I'm not judging that it's cool I want to own a Rolls Royce but. I don't know, like, at least you have something you're working towards, like something that keeps you excited and motivated about life. And then you talk to entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs look at dreams just the way I just said it. They're like, what? It's my right to dream. I'm going to dream. Who's mm -hmm. going to stop me? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I have a dream. I know I want to do this. I want to fix this. I want to, you know, achieve this. And, again, dreams don't have to be, like you mentioned in the board, they don't have to, don't have, to be worldly impact, right? Mm -hmm. Like, a dream could be to own a certain car or to take a certain vacation or to do something for your children a certain way. But it's a dream. It, it helps you through the tough times when you hold your vision for what you want and, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. And um, I think the biggest difference there is just that one side of the world believes that dreams are a, a luxury. Uh, What's that? It sounded like a luxury the way you were describing it. A luxury, it. yeah. A dream is like, yeah, you know, you get to have it when you have it. Versus the other side says it's a birthright. Like, yeah. When I have a dream. Hell yeah. Okay. And struggle. I know that this kind of reminds me of problems. So I'm curious how you are looking at the way that an entrepreneur and employee looks at struggle versus problems. What's the difference? Yes. There, I'm glad you asked. So problems. So let's just imagine uh, you're 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 taking a journey, right? So you're going towards um, you're, you're you're driving. You got to get from point A to point B, and all of a sudden you pull up and the tree's fallen. It's blocking your road, and so that's the problem. The journey is the struggle, mm. and so a lot of us have this view of struggle, which is like, why struggle when you don't have to? Like, what's the easier way? So let's say you were taking this journey and you see the tree is blocking the road, an employee will immediately say, let's just go back. Like. Why deal with this, right? Do we really need to get to the other side? Like, is it that we'll try tomorrow? Let's, what, maybe someone else will remove the tree out of the way. Um, versus the entrepreneur will say, well, hold on. I mean, what if we take that route? What if we just go around that way? Or has anyone, maybe this tree is really light. Let's just try to push it. Maybe we'll just get out of the way. Um, and they'll just try a little bit extra thing because they're not afraid of the struggle. So mm -hmm. when you're at the gym, you know, and you're lifting and you're, you're kind of lifting a weight, right? So you pick up a 20 pound weight. Um, that's a that's a problem right from the beginning. You, yeah, you've got to lift this thing. The struggle is, can you get those extra two reps in? Mm -hmm. You know, because those two reps, that's where you grow. If you want to get muscular, you got to rip your muscle, but you won't rip it if you put the weight down every time it gets tough. Yeah. So the struggle is, am I willing to, you know, when I fall and I scrape my knees, does that mean I quit riding the bike? Or do I get right back up, figure out why the heck I scraped my knees and why I fell, and then not do it again? And so a struggle is, think about it, our lives are a, a series of struggles. Like, that's just 
what that's it just is. how life is. Life is a struggle. And um, if you have an employee mindset towards it, you will shape your life in a way to avoid said struggles. And when you do, you will grow a lot slower, if at all, yeah. versus an entrepreneurial mind will say, bring it on. I got this. And that's why you'll see entrepreneurs grow so much quicker, typically, at least the successful ones, is because they're constantly challenging themselves to grow and learn. It's incredible listening to you because when I talk, when I think about struggles, the way you are describing it, it kind of sounds like the entrepreneur is a little bit more like a, a child, like with a curiosity about situations. So instead of looking at it with this sense of againstness, it's like, oh, there's something in the way. Let's let's play around. Let's see what's possible. And um, really good for me to hear you talking about this because you mentioned riding bikes twice, and I'm going to Burning Man this week, and I've never ridden a bike. I I, I don't know how to ride a bike. I can't believe I'm admitting this, but I have to. <laughs> Oh, wow. So awesome. I'm about to go into the struggle and I'm going to think of this conversation and be like, Onik told me just to keep trying. <laughs> so I'm going to keep at my bicycle at Burning Man in the yeah. desert, you know, and I've never done a drug. And apparently there's all sorts of things happening at Burning Man that I'm going to be a newbie, not doing anything, but just watching and being around. So I'm very curious what's going to come of that. But I will think of you as I'm riding my bike. This has been really scintillating conversation. I'm so grateful to have had you and everybody listening. Make sure that you check out his book, Escape. The Four Stages of Becoming a Successful Entrepreneur. Onik, where can everybody find you? Um, I'm going to be sharing this everywhere. I'm so excited for everybody to listen. Yeah, thank you so much. So listen, if you want to get a free copy of the book, um, it's absolutely free. You just cover shipping. That's it. And we ship anywhere in the world for the same low fee. But here's a really cool part. Um, because some countries, it might take two to three weeks for the book to reach you. We give you free instant online access. So you can actually be reading this book within the next 30 seconds. Go to escapebook.com. That again is escape, E-S-C-A-P-E, book, B-O-O-K, one word, dot com. And you'll see the book there. Forward's been written by um, Damon John from Shark Tank. Um, we have Robert Kiyosaki, who's endorsed it. Um, we have Kevin Harrington, Les Brown, Bob Proctor. People really are saying that I've truly decoded the mind of an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, what it takes. This is literally the foundational training. You can go try as many techniques and tactics to making money as you want without this foundation. It ain't going to happen, I'm telling you. Or you'll end up doing it the way I did and build a house of cards and pay a great price later. So get the book. It's an easier way to, to build to your success. Anything else about what we're doing here, just go to learn.com, L-U-R-N.com. That's our company. We literally, our purpose statement is to build a transformational home for entrepreneurs. So we do everything that's related to entrepreneurs. We train them, teach them, coach them, guide them. We've got tons of amazing opportunities there. So please visit us at learn.com. And other than that, you know, follow me on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. My, uh, my name is Onyx Singal. I appreciate any opportunity I get to talk to anybody. Just like today, I really love being on this. This yeah. is amazing. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a passion project. And everybody listening, stay tuned. I know I do after episode notes and conversation, and I've, you've got my mind going on it. So I will be sharing plenty of thoughts in the post episode. Take care, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks for listening to U Turn Podcast. Hey, it's Ash, and I am just reflecting on this past episode with Onyx Singal and completely inspired by all of his success, but more importantly, you know, continuing to be curious about his failures too. And, you know, like I've said before, I think it's tempting for a lot of entrepreneurs to talk about all of their success, um, but not to share about their failures while they're happening. It's almost like failure is just this tiny little blip on the way to success when really Onik pointed it out so well, failure, so what success really is, is just a combination of a lot of failures. And I so deeply resonated with his experience of having a successful company, um, my e-course, my job hunting course, um, which now I have the Job Offer Academy course. But before that, the one that I created, it went into the millions in just a few months, um, you know, after years of me being in debt, trying to create it and believing in it and blindly believing in it. And I told so many people I burnt the bridges behind me in the process of creating this, not meaning that I soured any relationships, but I was really willing to let go of everything that would distract me from this course that I wanted to get out in the world that I believed in on how to help people get a job offer. And looking back, 
Uh, I remember the failure that I experienced when the course made millions and then it started to fall apart. Lead costs tripled on Facebook ads. We couldn't afford as a company to pay for our marketing. Uh, our revenue and profits started to get slimmer. And I've got to say it was one of the most traumatic experiences and it sounds so silly to say that because what a first world problem to have a traumatic experience of losing a lot of money when most of the world is just living on a basic paycheck right but I don't think the trauma was in in the money I think it was in creating something and watching it fall apart and the real trauma was in the stories I told myself about what it meant about me and I think a lot of the times when we face failure we make meanings about what it means about us. And so I want to ask you the question right now. What have you, what do you have in your past that you view as a failure? And what have you made it mean about you and about the world? Or what have you not attempted that you really wish you would attempt because you're afraid of failing? And what is the meaning you're making about that thing you want to do that you're not doing? What are you telling yourself that's keeping you from doing it? Because all of these things are just beliefs. Whether we fail, whether we succeed, how you relate to the issue is the issue. And so I wanted to share with you some feedback on how I bounced back uh, because I can't speak for anybody but me and then created Cake Publishing, my ghostwriting, copywriting, and publicity house. Uh, it wasn't always a a success as a company, but I built it right after losing tons of money and going into more than $450,000 in debt and taking a lot of time to pay that off as I created my second company. And while it's thriving right now, I still feel the trauma of the past of failure. And I think it's interesting because the more successful Cake Publishing gets, the more I connect it and associate it with failures that I've had. And just that memory in my body of when things started to feel really good, they fell apart. I remember that feeling. And so when things are starting to feel really good in my company now, I remember that trauma of when things fell apart. And so the first step I want to offer you is to start to pay attention to the meaning you're making of an event. So maybe it's a failure, maybe it's some sort of a loss. And what you do is you want to just start to think about, you know, pay attention to what the thoughts are that you're thinking. Or if you're having a hard time with that, ask somebody to ask you about it. Um, ask a friend and ask for their feedback. Like, hey, what do you think I'm thinking about all this? What are my thoughts that you're hearing uh, that might be holding me back? A lot of the times your friends can hear you going on about things that are blocking you. Um, and if you ask for their feedback and they really are present and they're good listeners, they might have some brilliant feedback for you about the way you're believing about something, the way you're buying into something. So, for example, for the longest time, I didn't want to put another course on the Internet because I was so traumatized from my failure. So what I did was... I started telling everybody, you know, Facebook ads costs have gone up. You know, it's going to be impossible to get another course out there. There's no way I'm going to be able to do it, so there's no point of even trying. I would come up with so many stories and defenses so that I wouldn't have to put myself out there and experience the vulnerability of, and the hope of believing something could happen. Because we grew up in a society, right, where... Um, you hear people say, waiting for the other shoe to drop, or don't hold your breath, or don't get your hopes up. Um, all of these expressions, I think, ingrain in us in society not to have hopes because there's a vulnerability in hoping for something and believing in something, the vulnerability of putting yourself out there and believing that it's available for you. So the first thing is start to get aware of what you're thinking about, uh, what your thoughts are, and what meaning you're making of certain things in your life, certain failures you've had, or certain things you wish you were doing that you're not. What is the meaning you're making about it? The second thing is to question it. So I would write down a few things that are the meaning you're making about it. So in my case, I was traumatized by losing tons of money and my first business and all my success. So the stories I would tell and the thoughts I would have are it's, it's impossible to get something on the Internet right now with the cost of Facebook ads. That was one thought that I was having. Another thought I was having was the market's really saturated. Now there's a lot of people teaching job hunting, you know, and um, when I – created my methodology for the Job Offer Academy, there really was very little competition. Uh, the third thing I'll say is it's a lot of effort and I really don't like dealing with technology and I haven't found anybody good to help me with technology. So 
you know, it's going to be a mess anyway. So those are three things that I'm, stories that I'm telling myself, meanings that I'm making to prevent me from the vulnerability of getting out there. And the second step is to question it. So to really look at myself and say, is it really true that Facebook ads are so expensive it's impossible to sell a course? No, because I have a lot of friends crushing it at selling their course online. The second thing is taking a look at, you know, every single belief you've written down. Maybe you want to pick three to five of them. And the third piece, and I'm always going to tell you to do this, is to forgive yourself for buying into these beliefs and updating them with the truth. I forgive myself for buying into the belief that Facebook ad prices have tripled and I'm never going to be able to have a course online again. The truth is so many people have courses online and that means that it's possible for me too. Right? That's a perfect way to say it. I forgive myself for buying into the belief that the truth is, and you fill it in. I know I've told you guys this before, but I can't repeat it enough because I know how powerful it is. So just some post-episode reflections. I'm so grateful for Onik and his wisdom and his vulnerability. And just remember, your life and your quality of life is directly tied to how comfortable you can get with failure. And how comfortable you can get with failure is based on how powerful you are at managing your thoughts, at questioning your beliefs, and having that space between the moment you think something and the moment you buy into it. So with that said, I'm signing off. Can't wait to connect with you next week on U-Turn Podcast. So grateful for Onik. Check out his book, Escape, uh, at escapebook.com. Incredible guy. So lucky to have interviewed him and looking forward to connect with you guys later. Thanks again for tuning into this week's episode of the U-Turn Podcast. You can find all of the resources that our guest mentioned on our show notes at U-TurnPodcast.com. That's Y-O-U-T-U-R-N Podcast.com. Also, don't forget, on the website, we've got our four free e-courses, whether you want to land a new job you love, get clarity on the best career path for you, launch your dream business, or deepen your romantic relationships. I'll talk to you soon. Can't wait to connect on next week's episode.